<laughs> no, you're better off doing something like this, like... Okay, guys. <laughs> 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 Okay. Hi guys, I'm Paul Bowen and today I'm with the owner, CEO, the main man himself, Matt from OK Clothing. Uh, Matt's quite a shy guy so I've been brought in to help him <laughs> as a good friend um, come to life by asking a few questions that you guys have asked and hopefully we can get some answers for you. How are you doing Matt, you alright? Yeah, not too bad. How long have you run OK Clothing? Uh, this is going into the sixth year now. Six years, so 2000 and... End of 2013. 13, sorted. So, quick one. Everyone, the first question everyone asks, assumes it's spelt wrong, doesn't quite get it, where does the name OK come from and why has it got a W in it? <laughs> <laughs> so, the word, the word OK basically came from me and my friend uh, at high school is just a word that we used to say um, and it just kind of caught on from there so the scenario is where you would say it was basically almost like when you were agreeing to something so like are you coming out on Saturday and just be like okay and it just kind of <laughs> went from there to the point where when we used to go on nights out and meet new people they'd hear us saying it so much that it kind of like caught on as I'm sure yeah, you can yeah, agree with yeah I've heard it on a few nights um, okay. and it just kind of went from there so that's literally there's no real meaning to it the w, I don't really sure where the W came from, but it was just how we kind of spell it, and it just kind of yeah, it just went from there. So, so that's where the actual name has come from. But what about the actual clothing brand itself? How, how are the two linked? So at the time, I was a graphic designer at a motocross company, so I was always doing designs on the computer. And one day, um, I basically just designed a quick logo for it. Literally, just said similar to the original one that I have on right now, but it's a little bit different. Just said okay, EST two thousand thirteen with the lines under the bottom and I had a plain River Island t-shirt on that day and at the company I was at they did uh, shirt printing, so okay. like motocross shirt prints, printed it on a t-shirt, uh, got my friend to take a picture of me, put it on my Instagram and said new clothing brand coming soon, just purely taking the name. As a joke. Yeah. <laughs> And a few people, like, uh, my friends just commented like I'll have one, I'll have one, blah 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 and it just kind of went from there. So literally... Yeah, as right. naturally as it. It's like, basically. yeah, just like yeah, a there couple. Was no, there was no intention of actually having a clothing brand. It just kind of, I printed it, people wanted one, so I sold them, and then just went from there. So how, how did the growth of that happen? Was it just like one, two, three, four, literally? Yeah, basically. So I imagine you were probably one of my first customers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True story. <laughs> Got a one-off t-shirt. Um, so yeah, like, you'd be like, oh, I think I've just posted stuff like on my Facebook, like I'm getting these made, does anyone want them in what colour, what size? Mm -hmm. And I basically bought some cheap uh, Gildan t-shirts, Vinyl printed them myself, and I'm pretty sure I sold them for about a tenner. Okay, and 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. And uh, yeah, I just went from there. So, had a few done like that way, printed them all myself, learned about printing and things like that, different methods. And then from there, I started getting them properly screen printed. So, I, you had to start hitting minimums, um, chose a slightly different, better quality t shirt, and yeah, it just kind of snowballed from that. But it's always been pretty small baby steps. So, so we've gone from like a few t-shirts what are we up to now what's kind of the the kind of orders that you're seeing now from like them yeah first? from when i started so when i first started i could literally buy one or two of each one print them myself and then the next step was getting stuff screen printed so it wasn't necessarily how many t-shirts i was having it was how many of a set design which was basically at that point if i wanted this doing it was a minimum of 25 but i could do it across 15 colors if i wanted nowadays when i order uh, something like this like i've done in five different colors and then two camo patterns like you're looking at hitting a minimum of pretty much a hundred of each one so it is quite a jump and in that stage to be honest it is a bit risky when you start going into the higher minimums when you start going time because obviously like you know when you're starting off and you had one t-shirt two t-shirt it was pretty easy to to sell what what's the pressure like when you reach a hundred t-shirts yeah, not gonna lie, like even now it is a bit of a guessing game because some of the colours or designs or styles that I think will do well don't always do, like sometimes certain ones will catch you off guard, so that is the risk when you do 100, you do stand to potentially sell 100, restock, do another 100, or you could sell three of them, like, and then you go down the route of selling them and then you've not made your profit on them, you've still put money into advertising them, giving them to influencers, that kind of stuff, whether you sell... 100 and all the way you sell 10 there's almost the same expenses in it do you know what I mean uh, they still take up a fraction of your photo shoot and everything yeah. like that so you mentioned that you was working at the time when you released OK are you working at the same company now? no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone knows that uh, but yeah no so I was working um, 
when I, from the point where I started the brand, I worked for a, a year and a half full time as a graphic designer. As as well as a you do doing yeah yeah yeah. Well. So basically, I was I was probably two years into doing the graphic design. Started that one night, went from there. It took a while to get going, so it wasn't really too much work. But then, just before I quit, I was pretty much working from like nine till five, going home, doing half an hour of emails, going to the gym for an hour, coming back, and then pretty much working from well until like one two a.m. each morning. So then it became a bit more difficult. Yeah. What was the ultimate switch point where you thought, you know, because obviously you had quite a successful um, company at the time, you was working, but there's all, there's, I know as being a, a business owner as well, that there's always that risk of, you know, going yeah, working for yourself chip. and staying security. What was the final sort of like, was it was it the fact that OK was doing really well and you didn't need that basic wage? Did you think you could spend more time? Yeah, it was a bit of a mixture like I was... I was working and at the same time obviously orders were coming in on certain days obviously I want, at that point I used to send them out at night so everything was almost like a day behind so I was thinking like I'm kind of missing out here by not being able to dispatch stuff the same day things like the, my job was I become a bit stagnant so I was like head designer there there was no real way to move up I wasn't offered a pay rise I tried didn't get one so it was just little pushing factors like that that added to it um, I got to the point where I was earning enough money well more money through okay at that stage than I was through my job so I was just basically investing everything back into it and yeah I think it was because it when you run your own company and you handle everything yourself, if something needs changing, you change it. When you work for a company, you can suggest a change, but it doesn't necessarily happen. I found that quite difficult um, to the point where I literally just wanted to go in, do my work, go home. I didn't really enjoy my full-time job anymore, so that's when I made the switch. So how old was you, sorry, when you when you made the switch? Uh, good question, 2000. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, I think. Mid two thousand fifteen, so it would have been like twenty six. So it's just, it's it's still quite young, but at any point before that, obviously before you started, okay. Did you ever have any points where you thought, you know, what I want to be an entrepreneur, or you you've tried like a self business before, or anything like that? Yeah, not really. Like at the time, probably would have said no, but looking back, there was quite a few different things that I did, just like very small scale. So I've always been like selling stuff. So when I was younger, when I was at high school, I used to buy. Um, not sure if you remember packets of fireballs and sour balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to buy them from the local garage. Just used to go in and pay like twenty five quid for the entire box, buy them for twenty five p, sell them for fifty. That did all right. To be fair, it was a couple of extra quid each so, day. So a couple, of you, you was it's quite young. You were still. Yeah, 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 but without really realizing it. So I did that, and then my main customer that used to have like four packs a day, he went on a diet. So I saw <laughs> <laughs> that kind of business bankrupt. Yeah, that was it. Too much stock. I had to say that off cheap. Did that. And then I thought the other day how I used to make like just random stuff. I used to make like bird feeders, buy loads of wood and netting and stuff and sell them. Uh, did that. I used to sell motocross stickers at school. Again, to people that weren't even motocross. They probably didn't know what the logos were. I used to buy a big sheet, cut them up and sell them at like £2. I don't really know how I did that. <laughs> and then after that, I used to do, because uh, I was quite good at art, I used to do motocross drawings and commissions. So I sometimes did commissions for like pro Actually, I've, I've like just that. went there. I've actually got one. <laughs> 10 minutes later. This is, is this the one that you should have given me back this, 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 this is not a joke. See, Matt Loftus is your sales tickets in it. Um, Matt actually gave me this for his birthday, he's not. But like, <laughs> obviously you can see there, Matt, like you're, you're quite a talented guy yeah, when it comes, right. to, comes to drawing. So that, that's pretty cool, like, you know, I've got, I've got that. <laughs> So yeah, I used to earn a bit of money from doing motocross commissions, like the best one I did was when Tyler Atre won the world championship, his mum asked me to do a commission of that, so that was pretty cool, and then I did it just for local people, and then I used to try sell prints of the ones that I've already done, but it didn't really get going. Um, so then, yeah, I'm pretty sure after that, the next thing I tried was, well, accidentally was okay. What other entrepreneurs do you look at, um, and who's kind of your favourite people right now? Um, so the, probably the most famous one that most people would know, I quite like Gary Vee, uh, the guy in America that owns multiple businesses. Um, I quite like with him, he does like a daily documentary that you can watch on YouTube, basically shows how he runs a business, and so you can learn a lot from that, even mm. though his is massively, obviously, a lot bigger scale. But also at the same time, he's a very humble guy. He never shows off like most entrepreneurs what he earns, the cars he has, the car he has. Do you know what I mean? I don't really have a clue any of that. So I quite like him for that reason. And then I, the, probably the two other ones I like are people that are like within my category of fashion. Uh, ben Francis that owns Gymshark. Mm -hmm. His story is quite interesting. And then also um, I follow Reese Labore who owns Manier de Val. 
Um, so like constantly watching his Instagram stories, he shows quite a bit of insight into like his Facebook cards and like I've sent you before. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So yeah, I quite like to look at people that are kind of similar to kind of the direction that you would like to probably go yourself. You yeah. started OK and printing the logos and everything on the t-shirts because when I wanted to buy a branded t-shirt, the branded t-shirts at the time, like in Topman and stuff like that, places that I shopped were all very big where you could buy it and you could go to the motocross track with it, you could go for a meal, but you couldn't really wear it on a night out. So I think I kind of wanted to make a bit of a merge between those two at the time. Be very much into motocross, as yeah. am I. Um, would you say that's where the brand kind of started in the, in that kind of world of the motocross? Yeah, so when I started, like nowadays, if you started a brand and you had a lot of money, you'd probably go to like uh, high-end influencers or the people from Love Island and pay all those or whatever. But when you started, I basically had to try and think where I could get the most kind of eyes on the brand. And I knew a few pro motocross riders myself from going to my local track and obviously just been Who are they? Sorry. involved in the industry. So at the time, it was uh, Jamie Law, <laughs> Tommy Searle a bit later on, Graham Irwin, Mattis Caro. Uh, there's quite a range at the start. So I focused quite heavily. Yeah, yeah, names. but I knew them personally because, again, through the drawings that I used to do, uh, and another thing as well, I used to do uh, photography at the motocross mm -hmm. tracks. That was another way I earned money. And then also, got to know a few of the riders and stuff like that. So yeah, I just kind of leveraged who I knew at the time um, and then approached them. And if they were happy to wear the brand, then it kind of went from there. Yeah. You also mentioned a post to Love Island. Now I've actually seen people that have been on Love Island's um, Celebrity Big Brother. Is it the only way is Essex? Yeah. Um, how have you gone from motocross to sort of getting some really big time influencers? Um, I think basically as the brand grew, uh, similar to like if you was working way up through motocross, you'd work with, you'd get your friends to wear it, your club level riders, your national riders, then you can go and approach maybe someone that does the world championship. So it's just kind of gone from there. I didn't really go from a medium level motocross rider to Love Island or whatever, like because that is very different. Like you can sponsor a motocross athlete for the year, but like with a Love Island or whatever, they want like a one off fix fee to mm -hmm. do it so I just used my leverage so one of the ones that I did was uh, worked with people from Made in Chelsea so when they were quite small at one stage I probably had about at least half the male cast of Made in Chelsea wearing it but they were all like 10k Instagram followers and stuff like that and like they were emailing me saying like mm -hmm. could I have a deal kind of thing and so I just sorted it out through that and then obviously if you stay in contact with them you work well together it's easy to have them now whereas if you were to approach them as a new brand you'd have to put up like big money to get them wearing it. You've also met like, so obviously you've gone from like, you know, really top end, but what about the low end? I see a lot of people promoting, I see you asking for promoters, um, like we've talked before about micro um, promote, like influencers. micro yeah, yeah. influencers. How important would you say they are? And, um, and is it, you know, is it worth them getting in touch with you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like micro influencers and promoters is Nowadays, like I think if your brand doesn't have a story or a bit of a family kind of feeling to it, a community, you're going to struggle unless you do have the big names wearing it, which when you start out is very expensive, so it's hard to put the two together. Um, so like now, yeah, we have I have a lot, a lot of promoters uh, promoting the brand. People start on different, there's different levels to it. So obviously you have the people at the top, like your celebrities and that, and then you can have like your average person, maybe like yourself that mm -hmm. can get involved with the brand, get your own discount code, sell up, start promoting it, and move your way through the ranks. So another question from you guys, if Matt stops itching his arm. <laughs> Good. So another question from you guys is, what did you actually do before OK? Um, so after leaving school, I went to college, I did maths accounting and a double award in art, because at the time I wanted to be an accountant. Uh, it would have come in handy now, to be fair. Uh, did two years of it, thought it was pretty boring, so I wanted to go down the art route. Um, went to Manchester Met University and did a landscape architecture for four years. Uh, Gardening? Well, that... no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, I like to refer to it as basically the architecture of the outside world. Right. It's not gardening, not for four years. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I did that. Again, did a work... You, the uni work was really good, went and did three months work placement in the fourth year, realised it was just a lot of computer work, it was very bland, it's quite boring like being within that industry, so that gave me a bit of a heads up that maybe it's not what I wanted to do, finish uni, um, was just like, basically went into like a labouring job yeah. for a few months, got redundant, made redundant from that, um, because the company was struggling a bit, and then got offered a job as a graphic designer at a motocross company, which is what I did all the way up until OK. So I did that for three and a half years, really enjoyed it because again, it was quite creative. Yeah. So no, was, no really... fashion degree <laughs> in this at all? No, I was the kind of guy that like at high school didn't wax or gel my hair and wore like a little <laughs> shitty fleece that my mum had bought me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how I ended up here to be fair. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, I did that, uh, got into the graphic design, they did the odd bit of shirt printing on t-shirts and stuff, but it wasn't, I mean, it was like stag dude printing yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, it basically just grew from nowhere and I kind of learned it along the way. That's probably, again, one of the biggest lessons is if you throw yourself in there, you have no option but to learn. If there's only you that is running the company, unless you outsource the work or get someone else to do it, it's on you. So you do tend to learn a lot of stuff that you before you would see as like a boring task. Or if you was at a job, you might be like, I don't want to do that. Whereas when it's within your own company, you don't mind it kind of thing. So another question we've got is, what is your worst decisions that you've made uh, with OK? Worst decisions? Uh, probably most recently. So up until the last few years, everything's been pretty much baby steps. Like I got my website, it was about £40, went from there. Got it changed for a couple of hundred pounds a few years in and stuff like that. Whereas um, I think it was... At uh, the end of 2017, I decided to have a full custom website made, which looking back now was just too expensive for what it was mm -hmm. and the difference of what I had. But at the time, I thought, what do I need to do to be on like the similar level to like the competition that was ahead of me? And I was looking at the websites and I wanted that, but kind of like what I got from it. Like if you go on it, there's nothing wrong with it, but the back end for me is very complicated. It's hard for me to make changes without having to go back to the agency, which then costs a lot more money. So Looking back, I'm not saying I'm necessarily rushed into it, but again, I think I was a bit missold it in the sense mm -hmm. of that, which again is now that it's there and it's live, it's very hard. It's another big expensive change mm -hmm. to go to something else. Um, so probably the website has been that, uh, mainly just for money terms, though, like it works fine. Um, issues in the past with suppliers, trusting suppliers, like for example, the first time I had a, an order, um, I ordered some custom sweatpants, got them made, Everything was fine, they turned up, they were a little bit different to what I wanted, but went ahead with a second order because they sold well, and then just basically never heard anything. Basically, they took my money and that was it. Just took, just took your money? Yeah, that was it. So wow. uh, that was a bit of a tough one, like back in the day, to be working full time and to spend, say, like £800 on an order and to basically disappear. And unless that bank replied, I couldn't get it. It was a bit of a... It's it like, made, an, made, yeah, like an overseas Yeah, issue. it made, made me lose a bit of confidence in suppliers and stuff like that. So, But then again, it makes you wary to the point where you're, you're very analytical, so you, you, it probably prevents you from making that mistake again over and over in the mm -hmm. future. Um, so stuff like that, and then also issues I've had when I wholesale the brand in regards to getting payments and simple, simple logistics like to do with business of trusting people to pay on 30 days and then not, and then you're chasing something that you shouldn't be chasing. Yes. And so, so right now you're just, you're just business to customer, aren't you? Yeah, like you can't find your brand in, in, a, in another shop. No, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, Mainly because of that issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question is, uh, what is the best and worst garments, clothing, um, hat, or whatever it is you, you've done um, with OK? Um, starting off, let's let's start at the worst because things are going to be worse. What's, what's uh, the worst thing we've done? Well, that's the thing is, there's, a, there's probably a difference between the worst product I've made and the the worst selling product. So the because I had it made in quite bulk, like I think I had about 150 made. The bar oh, jacket of, of what's has this? literally the just jacket. sold out now. Yeah. yeah. So it has literally took almost months and years of just sailing it off and stuff like that. So looking back, that was a poor decision, the poor business decision. But, but, but the bad but thing the is, yeah, the, the, the bomber yeah. jacket, I had one, um, I know a few friends, and they were like, these look yeah, really yeah. cool. Again, I think like you said, maybe if you was in a store and you picked it up and felt it, you could justify paying a little bit mm. extra than it was for a hoodie and stuff like that. Mm. Um, in terms of the best selling products I've done was probably a few years ago when I did the matching kind of unisex sand and khaki track suits they sold really well at the time because the colors were on trend yeah um i had a lot of female influencers at the time wearing it so the sales through the girls and the unisex yeah. side of things was really good uh restock them they sold well and then again like um just little things like certain bobble hats back in the day they used to sell really yeah, well like i must admit i have got a i've got a khaki track suit myself yeah. and it's still going which i think obviously for the quality wise i think that's why a lot of people get it and get one again yeah but that's the thing the we issue. have a lot of repeat customers in that sense and then in regards to like the best products i'd say it's, it is like sounds a bit cheesy but it's yet to come probably the autumn winter collection and the poly track suit that we've got coming out uh, i've been wearing that for months sampling it and i just think that's for sure going to be the best product but i might be wrong <laughs> key uh, little fact that i just picked up on there you mentioned we yeah. is there anybody else <laughs> in your team um Talk, talk to me, is, is it just yourself? Are you looking to expand? Um, yeah, it, it is just myself. I've just got into the habit of describing everything as we, I think, from the social media posts and everything. We've had really good success from them. 
Are we planning on doing some more trade shows? Uh, yeah, we'll be at the Dirt Bike Show again this year, which is obviously a very motocross specific event. Um, a few more trade stands, I think, at the British Championship of the motocross. And then also I want to try and do a few different trade stands or sports sporting events. Um, not too sure what yet. Obviously, skate, mountain bike or BMX would be the easier one to transition into. So if you have any suggestions of events that you think we should be at, uh, just let us know in the comments and uh, we'll check them out for sure. And obviously we are the best that if you ever come to our stand, yeah, stand the banter buzz is full of loaded. <laughs> buzz. The buzz. Buzz. Um, so thanks guys for listening. Um, I, I think Matt's enjoyed it. I have too as well. If you've got any more questions that you'd like to ask him and uh, that, that you know he's too scared to ask himself, um, <laughs> I'll ask them for you. Leave a comment below, give it a like um, and comment and do everything that you can possibly do. <laughs> um, we really need the money. No, we don't really need We do actually really need the money. <laughs>